Welcome to this immense course on ancient church history. My name is Alan Vanderpaul, and I am the editor of this course. Mintz received permission from Covenant Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, to uh, format this course uh, according to the Mintz format and to teach it around the world um, as we see fit and as will help students. And so um, what you get here in this course, both printed and written, is from Covenant Seminary, but we have um, shaped it for our courses. When we talk about ancient church history, which is the topic of the course, I want to explain how we traditionally divide church history up. First of all, uh, from about the year 0 to 500, we call it ancient church history. From about the year uh, 500 to 115, uh, to 1500, we call it the medieval church. And 1500 to the present, we can call the modern church. Now there are ways to subdivide this so that the sections of church history are smaller than this. For example, in the last section, there is um, the Re Reformation, um, there's a Romantic period, and then a late period in church history. But in general, this is the way uh, we will shape um, how we treat the subject of church history. Something else I want to say by way of introduction is what we mean when we refer to centuries. As you know, a century is 100 years. But when we're talking about the 200s, historians refer to it as the third century. So whenever you hear me say uh, the second century, you know that that refers to the 100s, and the fifth century refers to the um, 400s, and so on. So when I say third century, I do not mean the 300s, I mean the 200s. Also, I think we should clarify what this course means when we talk about East and West. Um, when we talk about East and West, the East and the Western Church, we're probably dividing a line not far from where Jerusalem was, or is. And everything to the east of that longitude would be the Eastern Church, or in the east, and everything to the um, right left side of it would be the Western Church. Now, um, when the ch church actually splits, that division is going to be to the west of the line I just mentioned. But um, this particular lesson, the first lesson, is going to talk about to the east and to the west. Think about where Jerusalem was, and then uh, what's to the east of that we'll call to the east. This particular lesson concerns the growth and persecution of the ancient church. First, the ancient church grew remarkably. Um, some even non-secular historians have expressed their amazement at the success of Christianity in the first centuries. Andrew Walls talks about different movements, cultural movements, that the Christian church went through. The first movement was a movement from Judaism, or from Jews, to Gentiles. We know the church began primarily with Jews because uh, Christ came to fulfill the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, and he was born, raised, suffered, and died in uh, a Jewish context. And when we read the book of Acts, we see that it starts in Jerusalem, it ends in Rome. 
And somewhere in the middle of Acts, we see this transition from the uh, story of Christianity in a Jewish context moving to a Gentile context. Besides the uh, racial uh, movement or a cultural movement, there was the movement that we would call a social movement. And this means or refers to the fact that the Christian church began as a church of the impoverished. It began as a church of slaves, of women and children. Probably far more women in the church than men. And um, at the beginning, there were no people from the palaces of countries going to churches. Uh, Christianity began as the religion of despised people. But then things changed, even in the first century. Um, there is reference in Paul's um, writings about uh, certain members of Caesar's household um, becoming Christians or being part of the church. And increasingly, as church uh, grew and developed, more and more of the wealthy and the powerful uh, found themselves believing in Christ and coming to him in faith. Besides that, there's another movement, and that is a geographical movement. The church didn't merely grow near Jerusalem and Galilee. It went to increasingly distant places. Uh, the book of Acts itself uh, shows us that. Um, the gospel, as I said, uh, began in Jerusalem. Um, in the last chapter, Paul is preaching the gospel in Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire. Um, Christianity spread to Asia Minor, which today we call Turkey. Um, it spread to Greece and Italy. It traveled to Gaul, which is in modern France. And so um, Christianity spread uh, rapidly and to distant places. It also spread in North Africa on the south border or south coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And so uh, to the west of Jerusalem, uh, Christianity made um, remarkable strides. It is sometimes forgotten that Christianity also moved east. The birthplace of the church stood at the boundary between East and West. And it's significant that this infant religion, as soon as it was strong enough to leave its cradle, marched West, but also East. Those are the comments of Professor J.C. Wan, who um, is a historian. The first New Testament translation was in Syria. In other words, the first New Testament translation um, in another language of the, of the Bible that we have in the New Testament was translated in Syrian. Um, the first Christian hymn book was produced in Syrian. The first known church building was built um, in Odessa, which is near um, Upper Mesopotamia. And so uh, the church grew and it grew also to the east. Um, the first king who uh, made his state Christian uh, may have been in Armenia, which is in eastern Turkey. 100 years before Constantine, um, there was a remarkable movement of the faith towards the east. The Course talks about two areas where we see this. First, India. Uh, tradition says that the Apostle Thomas went to India to preach the gospel there. And um, the original lecturer of this course says that we probably should believe that tradition. If you go to Chennai, India today, that would be in the northeast corner of the country, you can see a memorial built not far from the city airport. And there you see um, 
a memorial of um, how the um, Hindus supposedly uh, martyred Thomas. And then, in downtown Chennai, you can go to St. Thomas Church, and the altar is built above the place where people claim Thomas was buried. So not only is there a tradition that he was there, there are monuments built to memorialize that idea or truth. About 120 years after Thomas died, there was someone else called Vantanus. He left a prestigious position in Rome in order to preach to the Brahmins and the uh, philosophers of India. And so Christianity spread not only to Syria, but also to India. The uh, Asian church produced some outstanding theologians, one of them named Tatian, and we will uh, hear about him in another lesson. Christianity spread to Persia and also all the way to Afghanistan. And so um, there was a remarkable spread of Christianity um, for a faith which originally consisted of the impoverished and the weak, that is a remarkable story. Now why did Christianity spread? Professor uh, David Calhoun, the original lecturer, says it is because of the power of the gospel. And he goes on to explain how there were so many religions present in Europe and uh, Asia it is remarkable that uh, Christianity could spread there. There were, first of all, the pagan religions. These would be the religions that worship the traditional Roman gods and traditional Greek gods. Um, these religions were all throughout the Roman Empire. At a popular level, they were very strong when the church began to spread the gospel. We read in Acts how Paul went to Lystra, where they worshipped the Greek god Zeus. In Ephesus, they worshipped the god Artemis, whom the Latins called Diana. And so Christianity faced many pagan religions. Also, there were many mystery religions, which came from the East. They promised a personal relationship to the divine. They promised what they would call personal salvation. The worshipers really had no personal relationship with these gods, but they tried not to offend them because the mystery religions promised salvation and fellowship with the gods. There were such religions from Persia, Mithras, and Egypt. In Egypt, they worshipped the sun god Isis. In Asia Minor, they worshipped Cybele. In addition to the mystery religions, there were philosophies, which were points of view about life, urging people to extend their loyalty to Stoicism, Epicureanism, and other philosophies. And so, um, there were many different views, many different ideologies claiming and calling for people's loyalties. And finally, there was the religion of the imperial cult. That would be the worship of Caesar. Beginning with the death of Julius Caesar in 44 BC, the Romans deified their emperors. Namely, they regarded them as gods. And I thought by the time we come to Augustus, the living emperor was regarded as God, and he was worshipped. And Romans practiced the worship of the emperor, probably preeminently. So, Dr. Calhoun says, Rome promoted an amalgamation of all these religions, a great combination, a complex, of a host of types of religions, all at one place. Only Christianity 
and Judaism were exclusive religions claiming the loyalty to only one God. And the magistrates or rulers often charge Christians this way, you do not worship the gods, you do not sacrifice to the emperor. With all these religions in place, you could pile up one religious insurance on another, Dr. Calhoun says, and you would never feel safe. But Christianity made a clean sweep. It did away with all these religions, pagan, mysterious, philosophers, and the imperial cult. And it called men and women to faith in Christ alone and claimed that he gave all that we need to be made right with God. And that message had great power to the people so confused by this huge array of religious options. Not only do we have the power of the gospel to explain, to use to explain the spread of the, go of the gospel, also the witness of Christians. Christianity was victorious because the early Christians outlived, outthought, and outdied the world around them. We know that the ordinary Christian was a missionary. In the early period of the church history, Christians all viewed themselves as missionaries. So a merchant would travel from one city to the other city to do business, but he also used it as an opportunity to take the gospel with him. A neighbor would talk to his neighbor next to his house, and he used that relationship to present the gospel to him. Mission work, witnessing, was not considered optional or the gift of only a few. It was a way of life in the early church. And when they showed their lives to the world, their lifestyles deeply impressed. Tertullian, a church, uh, church leader whom we're going to refer to later said, it's mainly the deeds of a love so noble that led many to brand us. Tertullian says, this is what the pagans are saying about us. See how they love one another. See how they are even ready to die for each other. That love Christians had for one another overflowed, and it gave Christians a brand, a reputation. It has been asked, what was the role of Christian, of church, of children in the early church? Women and slaves were accepted. What about children? Well, the Course is going to mention children and the question of infant baptism later. But we want to say at this point, um, there wasn't much said about the role of children in the literature of the early church. So I think we have a brief summary of how the church spread some of the general causes and some of the opposition that Christians faced. Now we're going to go to another topic, the topic of persecution. When we read Acts and the Epistles and the Gospels, we recognize that persecution came to Christians mostly from the Jews. And that's mostly due, I suppose, to the fact that only Jews encountered Christians at that time. If you read Acts, the persecutors were Jews. When Paul preached to new cities, it was the people from the Jewish synagogue who mostly opposed him. But in a few decades, things changed. Rome became not the protector of the church anymore, but the chief persecutor. Rome has become, as John describes her in Revelation, the great Babylon. And so we're going to look a little at the persecution 
that the early church experienced at the end of the first century. Roman persecution lasted from the 60s all the way down to the 320s. So there were about two and a half centuries of persecution. It began under Nero, the wicked emperor of Rome. A Roman historian, Tacitus, gives a good impression of the awful persecution Christians faced under Nero. He wrote, covered with skins of beasts, Christians were torn by dogs and perished, or they were nailed to crosses and burned by flames to serve as nightly illuminations in Nero's gardens. In other words, they were burned so that Nero could have torches to light his gardens. This is from Tacitus, who wasn't necessarily sympathetic to Christians. He was just describing what happened. But the fiercest persecution against Christians happened much later, under the persecution of Diocletian, the final and fiercest attack against Christians. Now, Dr. Calhoun wants to make two points about this persecution that will help us a little understand it. First, he says these persecutions were sporadic. In other words, Christians were not suffering under persecution for 250 years without relief. Persecutions came and then they were pacified. They ended. And then sometimes after long periods of peace, persecutions against Christians came again. The other point he wants to emphasize is that until the end of this era of persecution, very few of them were empire-wide. No systematic empire-wide persecution. In the middle of the third century, persecution was localized, either here or then there. And it might happen in North, Amer in North Africa, and then it might happen in France, and then it might happen in Asia Minor. But until the very end, it did not happen everywhere all the time. Until the first empire-wide systematic persecution under Decius, there was no concerted effort to wipe out the Christian church across the whole empire. And there are some wonderful accounts of Christians who suffered under this persecution. Many Christians were not faithful, and we will talk about that later in this course. Many people apostatized, which means they fell away from the faith. Not every Christian was able to stand like Polycarp. Polycarp was Bishop of Smyrna. You remember in Revelation 2 and 3, one of Jesus' letters is to the church in Smyrna. Polycarp was a man who knew the Apostle John. And when he was brought uh, to be burned at the stake, he said before he died, I serve the Lord and I will serve him in my death as I have served him in my life. There's also the story of a 22-year-old woman, Perpetua. She was the mother of an infant child. She wrote a diary from her prison cell in Carthage, North, Af North Africa. This is probably the first writing we have of a Christian woman. It is a wonderful account of her courage and faith in the midst of awful tension and eventual death. There is the martyrdom of 40 soldiers, which probably happened in 320 AD. After that martyrdom 
persecution ceased in the western part of the empire because it is after the date of the Edict of Milan, which we will discuss later. Many of the stories of these persecutions um, get from this period that would have enhanced and elaborated certain elements that grew through the years. But I think it's good to believe that the story of the 40 martyrs actually took place. There's a book called Quo Vadis, an exciting novel. It describes the persecution of Christians under Nero. A much more competent book is the book called The Flames of Rome by Paul Mayer, a very enjoyable and accurate book of what took place. But now let's ask the question, why? Why were Christians persecuted? There are many reasons given, and I'm going to list some of the accusations they faced. One accusation accused them of cannibalism. Non-Christians knew very little of what went on in their worship services. But they heard about eating Jesus' body and drinking his blood. And so outsiders imagined that there were people engaged in cannibalism eating human flesh in the secret meetings of Christians. Another charge against them, they disrupted business. We know from Acts 19 that because Christianity spread in Ephesus, fewer people were buying idols that the silversmiths made. And so there's some truth to this, that as people abandoned paganism, those whose work depended on paganism suffered. Another charge was gross immorality, including incest. Christians called each other brothers and sisters. They were known to greet each other with a holy kiss. And outsiders regarded this as incestuous and improper. Christians were charged of being against family. Perpetua the woman who suffered in Carthage and died in prison, was begged by her father to renounce the Christian faith. But she said to her father, if you look at um, a pot, you can't make it something else, can you? The pot is a pot. And he said, yes, it is true. She said, I am a Christian. And you cannot change that either. And so Christians displayed greater loyalty to Christ than to family members. And so they were accused of being against family. Christians were also charged or accused of poverty. They ridiculed Christians because it seemed only Christians had the kind of poverty they did as a group. They were charged with atheism because they refused to bow before Caesar, who in Roman culture was the greatest god. And since they did not submit to Caesar as god, the Romans called Christians atheists. Christians were accused of novelty, meaning they've come up with a completely new idea. And so Christians responded that their religion comes from the beginning of the human race, from the first pages of the ancient Bible. Christians were accused also of not being patriotic. They didn't attend the pagan festivals which honored the state and Caesar. They didn't engage in the sexual immorality taking place in these festivals. And so they were accused of not taking part in um, government-sponsored religious ceremonies. Finally, Christians were accused of bringing disaster to Roman society. Because Rome was disintegrating 
Rome's grip, its power, was weakening, and Roman society was falling apart. And the non-Christians basically said, this all started to happen when Christianity began to rise. How should the government react to Christians? Trajan, an emperor, wrote a letter to Pliny the Younger, governor of Bithynia, because Pliny the Younger was wondering how to respond to Christians. Should he massacre all of them? What should he do? And the emperor says, Christians are not to be sought out. Do not go looking for them. But if someone denounces someone as a Christian, then bring that person in and question him. And if he refuses to recant and to begin worshiping our gods, then that Christian must perish. That was the way it was until A.D. 250. So it took a jealous neighbor or an envious associate of someone to be spiteful, to bring charges against the Christian so that it would result in the Christian suffering and persecution. And Christians did refuse to worship the emperor. Jews did as well, but Jews were exempt. They had received centuries before permission to take exception to the Roman religion. Once it was decided by the Roman government that Christians did not belong to Judaism, they were no longer viewed as enjoying that exemption, that Christians could be persecuted in ways Jews could not. To worship the emperor would mean there would be um, a great risk of dying for the faith. Now, what was the result of this persecution? What was the purpose and the result? The purpose of persecution was to cause Christians to apostatize, to fall away. Most of the Romans, the emperors and officials, did not want to kill Christians as much as they wanted them to um, simply stop being Christian. So pressure was put on in a host of ways in various places to produce apostates, people who once claimed Christ, then renounced him. People at large, including Christians, if they were to get through the persecution, were required to get a certificate called a libellus. And it basically said that this person has worshipped Caesar and offered sacrifices to him. And so, if one is accused of being a Christian, but he had this document, the libellus, he would be freed from government persecution and government trials. This created a problem in the church later on, because some Christians Sometimes many Christians sought that document to protect themselves. But later, when there was no persecution, these people wanted to get back into the church. And those who remained faithful throughout that time deeply resented them trying to come back. Later, we will see how in two times of church history, this caused great trouble and many questions were brought due to Christians who gave in. What were the results of this? Well, first, it purified the church. And secondly, it extended the church. F.F. F. Bruce says this in his book called Spreading Flame. Christianity was organized for catastrophe. In other words, the church was prepared for this by what Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew 5, blessed are those who are persecuted 
because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The church was ready for this. Actually, Calhoun says, I think we will see a kind of problem develop because Christians began to want to be persecuted. The church fathers said, if you are brought before the authorities, do not deny Christ. Die like a Christian, but do not try to be persecuted. Do not try to be martyred. This may seem strange that people were trying to be martyred, but they were. The Christian father, Origen, when he was a teenager, saw his father taken out and murdered. And he wanted to be martyred too. His mother had to hide all of his clothes in the house so he would not go out with nothing in order to hunt for persecution. But persecution did purify the church. It's easy to see how. If being a Christian meant you ran the high risk of persecution and death, then certainly only those who truly trusted in Christ would run that risk and remain faithful to him. Yet, you can see another way that persecution purified the church. Once persecution was outlawed, the church had another problem. It's called nominalism, meaning people were Christians only in name, and their lives didn't show it, and they couldn't confess biblical faith in Christ. Suddenly, the church became far more effect ineffective, became corrupt, because many in the church were not true Christians. And that demonstrates how persecution kept the church pure. The second result is that persecution extended the church. Tertullian made this famous quote, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Over and over again we read of stories of persecution and faithfulness. And over and over we read how their deaths, the deaths of Christians, greatly moved the watching pagans and prompted them to come to Christ. Think of the story of the jailer who watched Paul and Silas in the Philippian jailer. They watched them sing and praise to God. And then he wanted to know what their faith said and claimed. I think you can say something that I have always said at this point, or have almost always said. Samuel Moffat, uh, in his book called Christianity in Asia, shows that there were times when in Asia persecution just stayed and lingered with no relief. And the church in those places was destroyed. Thus, we see, it is not always the case that persecution extends the church. But it did, especially in the West and especially in the early part of the church. Before we close on the subject of persecution, let me just say this, says Dr. Calhoun. We usually think of the history of the early church as a time of persecution only. It was a time of persecution in church history. But people have said, and I think they are right, that more have been martyred for Christ in the last 50 years than were martyred in the first 250 years. And part of this is due to the fact that more Christians exist today. And yet, we see from how the early church Christians persevered, encouragement for us, as we always face the possibility of persecution on us. Dr. Calhoun says he's been asked about this libellus, the little cards of anyone who wanted to avoid persecution. 
These cards were checked from time to time. He says, let me read part of one. It says, to the commission chosen to superintend the sacrifices at the village of Alexander's Isle. I have always sacrificed to the gods, and now in your presence and in accordance with the edict, I made sacrifice and poured a libation and partaken of the sacred victims. I request you to certify this below farewell. In other words, the Christian who had the card and showed it to people to make sure that he was a pagan, they gave a card which basically said they wholeheartedly had indulged in pagan religion. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and that refers to those who did keep the faith, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race. Welcome to Lesson 2 in the Mintz Course on Ancient Church History. The first topic we're going to discuss concerns apologetics and the apologists. Maybe I should explain very briefly what apologetics or apology means. It has the idea of defending the truth, defending the gospel, in the light of what non-Christians say. So apologetics answers the non-Christian objections. But usually it also does it by presenting the truth as well, not merely tearing down, but building the listener up in the knowledge of the gospel. When we think of apologists in the New Testament, we can think of Stephen, the martyr, in Acts 7. He uh, addressed the objections of some of the uh, listeners in his audience. He also proclaimed Christ as his hope. When we go to New Testament church history, we see that early on the church had its apologists. One was named Justin Martyr. And we know mostly about this in his life in what he wrote called An Answer to Trifo. Trifo was a Hellenistic Jew, and I think I want to explain what that means. We know what Jew means. Hellenism, or Hellenistic, refers to Greek culture, Greek thought, and a Greek way of life. Trifo then was a Jew who um, had absorbed Greek culture and thought like the Greek philosophers did. He was a good friend of Justin Martyr, and they had a discussion, a dialogue, that lasted for a couple days. In his defense or apology, Justin Martyr does two main things. First, he gives his own testimony, telling what it was like for him to become a Christian. David Calhoun, who um, has written the original lectures, says that Christian apologists typically did this. They explained their own personal experience of becoming Christians, and they explained what it was like for them to live the Christian life. The other part of Justin's argument was to Trifo, who knew something of the Old Testament. And he tried to show how Jesus fulfilled the Jewish scriptures, how the Old Testament predicted the coming of Christ. Trif or Justin became quite enthusiastic about this. And he starts to add one Old Testament text to another and to another so that he might overwhelm Trifo and convert him to the Christian faith. <laughs> 
Justin argued that to see Christ in the Old Testament is itself a gift of the Spirit. In saying this, he reflected 2 Corinthians 3.16, which says, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. There he did present the gospel. I think it is a very clear to trifle. According to Justin's book, the debate went on for two days, and neither could convince the other. Dr. Calhoun says this was a very impressive debate because it was so courteous and friendly and respectful. At the end, Trifo ends his part of the debate this way. I confess that I am delighted with our discussion. We have found more than we expected, more indeed than we possibly could have expected. And if we could do this more frequently, we should be greatly helped in searching the scriptures themselves. But since you are on the eve of departure and expect to sail any day, please remember us as friends when you are gone. Dr. Calhoun says that is a remarkable way for the non-Christian trifo to end his comments. Please remember that we are friends. In other words, Justin tried to defend and present the gospel in a kindly, loving way. Dr. Calhoun says this is not how many Christian apologists performed and treated the non-Christian world. There is the Babylonian Talmud, which added anathemas or curses against Christians. And Christians, such as Chrysostom of Constantinople, began to think of Jews as Christ killers. And so there was the practice in many places of the church where uh, defense of the gospel merely consisted of attacking the enemies of the gospel and not seeking to befriend them so that they might listen to the gospel. Now, as the church entered the second century, the real opponent no longer consisted of Judaism, but of paganism. This is similar to the truth that at about the beginning of the second century, Jews no longer were the main persecutors, but the Roman world was. And so, there were many anti-Christian writings now coming from the Roman world. You could find in cities crude uh, examples of graffiti painted on walls, which made Christians look uh, ridiculous and, made, and mocked them for their weakness. One um, bit of graffiti had a Christian symbol, Christ on the cross, but drawn in the form of a donkey. It says in Greek, Alexander worships his God. We do not know anything about Alexander mentioned in that piece of graffiti, but someone disliked him and his God. There were also sophisticated attacks against Christians. For example, a man named Celsus wrote his book called True Reason, and he gave all the reasons he could think of based on human reason to reject Christianity. Dr. Calhoun says he practically uses every argument invented by man, used even today, to make Christianity seem improbable, unlikely, and foolish. Now let us talk about some of the early apologists. These apologists wrote books to give a defense of the faith. We're going to mention three. The first is the author of the Epistle to Diognetus, written by Diognetus. He invites someone to consider the superiority of Christianity to both Judaism and paganism. His letter describes Christians as the soul of the world, 
In other words, the soul gives understanding to a person's personality, um, gives light and honesty to a person's character. That's exactly what Christianity does for human society, for the world. And so, it was sort of um, a parallelism between uh, his understanding of the role of the human soul and his understanding of Christians in human society. Dr. Calhoun says, it is disappointing to read church fathers in this time because there's so little mention of grace. Grace seems to go underground after the apostles until the time of St. Augustine. And when we do find some exception, some mention of grace, it is most satisfying. The epistle to Diognetus comes closer to a real understanding of Paul's doctrine of grace, he says, than um, he has seen in other writings of the ancient church before Augustine. Another apologetic writing is from um, Minucius Felix. He wrote the Octavius. This is a conversation, a dialogue, between a Christian named Octavius, Octavius and a Greek pagan named Cecilius. The pagan argues against Christianity intellectually, and the Christian refutes his argument point by point. The Octavius is sharply reasoned, sometimes winsome or clever. Again, the level of courtesy is very high. And Calhoun says almost all the arguments against Christianity ever used can already be found in this book. In this book, the Roman pagan Cecilius is finally converted by Felix and becomes a Christian. A third example of apologetics comes from Justin Martyr. We've seen him as a man who testifies to Trifo, but he also wrote academic books, one called Apologies. Here he defended Christianity against the pagans. Now at this point, we want to show two widely different approaches to apologetics. Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian. The question that the church faced early on was, how is Christianity to be presented to the pagan world of the Romans and the Greeks? The Christian connection to Judaism is clear. Um, Christianity, in some sense, arose out of Judaism because the Old Testament foresaw the coming of Christ. But what about the pagan philosophers living in Rome, in Greece, in Alexandria, which was in northeastern Egypt? What about Christianity? How does it relate to these completely non-Christian thinkers. It is interesting to see the church in certain parts of Africa today wrestling with the same problems. How is the church to respond to current African non-Christian thought? African religions should make a clean break question or are they to see commonalities between paganism and Christianity? The first man we want to mention is Clement of Alexandria. Alexandria was the city which had much influence under Hellenistic thought, Greek thought. It was the city where the Septuagint was translated so that Greek-speaking Jews could understand the scriptures. There was a massive library in Alexandria. It was a center of great learning. Clement was from Alexandria. 
And so when the question is asked, should Christians re repute, should they repudiate Greek thought, Clement's answer was, if someone needs food, let him milk the sheep. Let him shear the wool if he needs clothing. In this way, Clement was saying, let us benefit from Greek learning. He liked it. He loved it and he would not abandon it. Clement, Clement took over for the church not only the Jews' Old Testament, the Christians said that's ours, it is part of the Christian canon. Clement also said great philosophy is ours, that's ours, and it will help us. Philosophy for the, so philosophy for the Greeks was like the law for the Jews a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. One church historian says, Clement's reverence for the greatest and noblest achievements of Greek humanism is never unqualified. He loves Plato and Homer, but he does not read them on his knees. Meaning, for him, philosophy was basic, important, and preparatory for the gospel but it is human and only partial. This was a bold move and an important one, but it was not without danger. When men like Clement began to talk like this in the intellectual center of Alexandria, there was always the danger that too much pagan influence would somehow become part of the message Christians preached. When you try to join two separate religions and put them together to form one, we call that effort syncretism. And that was a danger where Clement's way of thought will lead. But now we go to another side of this question, how does Christian thought interact with non-Christian thought? And we think of Tertullian from Carthage now in central northern Africa. Tertullian was forceful, once a lawyer, then he became a Christian scholar. You can read his famous quotations on many topics. Here's one of them about Christianity and pagan thought. What has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What has the academy or universities what do they have to do with the church? We have no need of curiosity about Greek thought after we have Christianity. No need for inquisitiveness after we have the gospel. Since we believe we desire nothing else to believe, for the first thing we believe is that there is nothing else we ought to believe. Clement was trying to bring Athens and Jerusalem close together. And by that we don't mean the two cities politically. We mean two cultures. The culture which scripture creates and the culture which human thought creates. Tertullian did not like what Clement tried to do to bring together human thought and biblical thought. It's clear that Clement's views were tempted to become syncretistic. Therefore, Tertullian took a strong stance against it because the temptation to apostatize, to compromise the gospel was great and Tertullian was determined to stand against that temptation. But there was also a danger in Tertullian's approach. The danger is almost total isolation from culture. We should not think of Tertullian, though, as though he tried to stay far away from culture. He was a great scholar and theologian. And we will see later that he did much to help the church in its theology about the Trinity. Tertullian, though, said, 
Philosophers knock at the gate of truth. This sounds almost like Clement. But the way Tertullian explained it was this. They stole any truth they had from the scriptures. In other words, it's not that we have to compromise with pagan thought in order for pagan thought to learn something. When in fact they go to the Bible and learn a few things themselves, we don't give them credit for that. We give the Lord the credit and not the system of human philosophy. Tertullian was on one side, Clement on the other. Clement wants to show some continuity with culture. Tertullian wants to make a complete break with human reason and Greek thought. Addressing this kind of problem or tension in the church, Richard Nabor wrote a book called Christ and Culture. And he says basically in the history of the church there have been five approaches in terms of how we relate to Christian and cult, Christian pagan culture. First, he says, there is the Christ of culture. By that he means Christianity and secular thought are very close. And they agree on many, maybe most things. Nebor cites Eusebius of Caesarea as an example of the Christ of culture. Eusebius was a historian of the church. And when Constantine became a Christian uh, and started to be easier on Christians than previous emperors had been, um, Eusebius believed that Constantine was virtually Christian or part of the Christian movement merely because of that. And he wanted to see government and church as though they have the same plan and the same views. Then there's Christ um, against culture, above culture. According to Niebuhr, Clement of Alexandria is a good example of this. He also says Thomas Aquinas, whom we will discuss in the next course, was another example of this. They see a lot of connection between Christ and culture, but they don't want to get syncretistic. They don't want to give non-Christian thought equal say in how Christians are going to believe and live. Then there is the view of Christ in paradox with, with culture. I'm sorry about that. Christ in paradox with culture. This means um, their intention and sometimes say the opposite things. According to Niebuhr, this was Luther's view. Luther said, just put up with a bad situation. You have to be in the world. And um, the world says exactly the opposite of what God says. Uh, live with both, but be faithful to the Lord. There was another one called Christ the Transformer of Culture. This view says 
Christians should address culture and um, as cultural beings should express their Christianity um, in all that they do. And according to Niebuhr, um, we see this in Calvin and um, in Augustine. So there were different ways the church was advised to relate to the pagan culture around it. Some of it was very antagonistic of culture. Some was very embracing of non-Christian thought. Uh, some said, use it for the Christian's purpose. Some said, change it for the uh, glory of Christ. So um, we see a great variety, and we only mention this now to understand that there has been a great variety in the history of the church. Now we go on to a new subject regarding orthodoxy and heresy. Orthodoxy refers to the truth, to true teaching. It often means the true teaching which the church has historically believed. Heresy is that which opposes or rejects orthodox teaching. I had one professor who said the church historically used heresy, that word, to refer only to errors so serious that if a person held to them, he could not hold to the Christian faith as well. However, I think uh, Calhoun uses the word heresy a little more generally, serious errors which contradict the Christian truth. The question arises, what came first in church history? Did orthodoxy come first, or did heresy come first? Eusebius of Caesarea put it this way, orthodoxy does not have a history, it's eternal. Heresy has a history, has arisen in particular times and through particular teachers. Dr. Calhoun believes it's not quite as simple as um, Eusebius claims. He quotes Augustine to say, the rejection of the heretics brings into relief what God's church holds and what sound doctrine maintains. Augustine, in other words, saw heresies as bad and destructive, but also as having a place in God's plan of teaching the church. Calhoun wants to suggest that we look at it this way. There was orthodoxy in the church, correct belief, but much of it was implicit, meaning not stated and not defined, not spelled out fully, not understood completely and clearly. But then heresy came, and the church clearly saw its error, and then responded to that heresy by saying and defining the faith they implicitly believed. In other words, take the example of the doctrine of the Trinity. Christians believed that Jesus is God. They knew the Father is God. They believed the Holy Spirit is God. But they did come to understand it, so they talked about it clearly until error came. And then, when someone said Jesus is not God, the church understood that they believed this is not the truth they have believed. And so, in response to heresies, orthodoxy has come clearer as to what they believe. They've stated it concerning what they knew instinctively they believed. Now, with that in mind, there are three big heresies in the early church that we want to summarize. The first, Gnosticism. There was some Gnosticism 
that arose in Judaism. But Gnosticism is primarily a Greek philosophy which infiltrated the church. There were three characteristics of Gnosticism that we want to mention right now. The first is dualism. The word dualism has the idea of two. And it means there are two realities which oppose each other. It could be there is good against evil, or there is spirit against flesh, so that there are two different principles in the, in the world, in the universe, which are always against each other, always oppose each other, and there is a right and a wrong fighting each other. The Gnostics believed that there were two powers, not one. They did not believe in one God, but two. There was an evil God and a good God, somewhat equally matched. In other words, they both had about the same amount of strength. They believe that the evil God created the universe. And so, the universe is evil or bad. It's full of sin, evil, and trouble. This world is bad. The physical body is bad because the evil God made them. But when he made man, he made a mistake. He somehow, by mistake, created divinity inside us. So now the divinity is trapped inside our evil bodies. According to Gnostics, this foolish evil god is Yahweh, the god of the Old Testament. He's the one who made this mess in which we live. He's not the same as the true eternal God of the New Testament. And when Yahweh created the world, Gnostics said, he accidentally put that spark of divinity in us. Secondly, Gnostics believed in what we call docetism. The first part of the word comes from a Greek word that means seem, something that appears. And Gnosticism said that Jesus did not have a real physical body. It only seemed he had a physical body. He had the appearance or the form of a body but he was really part of the spirit world. You notice that Jesus could not have a body and be good if you're a Gnostic because the body is evil. And so to get them out of that consequence, they said Jesus didn't really have a real body. The Gnostics said there are ways for the person to liberate himself from his evil body so that his divine spirit might have rescue. Um, the Gnostics of Alexandria, some of them said, you had to take 365 steps to get out of your evil body. And each step involved learning a secret knowledge, almost a password, and through knowledge, you could take each of these steps to the point where your spirit was delivered from your evil body.
So for Gnostics, salvation was a matter of knowledge. You had to know something to get out of this bad step. You had to know something else to get out of the next step so that finally you might be liberated. Maybe you've heard of the Gospel of Thomas. It's been talked about a lot in modern scholarship today. It's not in the Bible, but it is a Gnostic work. And it teaches this kind of salvation plan. It teaches these aspects of um, Gnosticism. Now, there's another religion or error that we want to talk about, and that is Marcionism. Marcion was influenced by Gnosticism. He believed that we are made by an evil god, our bodies were, and he believes that one can escape the trap of this evil body through Gnostic methods. Gnosticism, uh, Marcionism, um, especially had an influence on the church in the way it treated the Bible. Marcion um, did not believe that all of the Bible should be accepted by the church. He accepted only parts of the New Testament. He believed the Old Testament came from the evil God, Yahweh. He also followed Paul exclusively. So Luke, Acts, and ten letters of Paul formed his entire Bible. One writer said that in the ancient church, only Marcion understood Paul, and he misunderstood him. And what F.F. F. Bruce meant when he said that is this. Paul taught we are not saved by obeying the law. And so Marcion liked the fact that Paul was against the law. But what, Paul, what Marcion failed to understand is that Paul was talking about justification by faith. We need to be saved by faith, not by obedience. So although Marcion understood what few people understood in that time, that Paul spoke against using the law to be saved, um, Marcion denied what Paul advocated for us to be saved. That is faith in Christ. The Old Testament, God created the bad world with its insects, fierce beasts, and sex, and other things Marcin did not approve. And so um, he clearly was holding to Gnostic views. Now Marcin's limited selection of Bible books gets us to the topic of canon. Canon refers to a Greek word which means measuring stick. And um, the Bible is our canon because what it teaches us is our measuring stick telling us what God demands we do and what God demands we believe. And um, we believe that all 39 books of the Old Testament and 27 books of the New together form our canon. The church was pushed to define which books belong to the canon when Marcion picked only the writings of Luke and most of the writings of Paul. Again, the church implicitly understood that Marcion was wrong. But when Marcion spoke, it forced the church to discuss it and to actively work on it. And we will see later how the church resolved the question of the canon. <laughs>
The third error we want to notice is called Montanism. Montanism was founded by a man named Montanus. And he stressed the work of the Holy Spirit. He said um, that we have moved out of the dispensation of Christ. And now we are in the era of the Holy Spirit, a new age. We could say that we're in the dispensation of the Spirit. Just as the Spirit spoke through Paul, he is still speaking. And when asked, who's he speaking through, Montanus said, well, he's speaking through him and through some of his associates. He says, the reason the gifts the apostles had have ceased, the miracles, the inspiration they received from the Spirit, is because the church has lost sight of the Spirit. The church has become worldly. And he was trying to call the church back to the Holy Spirit. Another emphasis of Montanus was that he emphasized the end times. And he tried to stress so that people would believe that Christ's return would be very soon. Also, he stressed strict discipline. And um, amazingly, some pillars of the church were persuaded by him. One man was Tertullian, the very skilled scholar who helped the church uh, understand the doctrine of the Trinity, um, who was against any kind of merger between non-Christian thought and the gospel. This Tertullian uh, joined the Montanist movement. So with Gnosticism, Montanism, and Marcionism swirling around the second century and winning converts, it was important for the church to respond. And in the following um, lesson, we will see how the church responded in three different ways. Welcome to the third lesson of the Mint's course on the ancient church history. At the close of lesson two, we talked about the different heresies and doctrinal problems confronting the church, Gnosticism, Montanism, and Marcionism. And we learned that the church was going to need to defend the truth by creating a canon, establishing a creed, and creating more organization in the church under the bishops. We start lesson three with those three topics. The church father Irenaeus once wrote, the authority of the church rests on three things, on the canon of the Bible, on the apostolic creed as the normative rule of faith, and on the episcopate, the bishops as guardians of the truth. So those three things, the canon, the creed, and the bishops, are the topic of the first half of lesson three. As I said yesterday, or at the last lesson, the word canon means the rule that is to be followed. <clears throat> it comes from the idea of a ruler or measuring stick. And the Bible is our canon. It gives us a measure of our lives and the measure of what we should believe. The problem was that the church faced more than the 27 books it now has in the New Testament. And the question was, what should the church do with them or think of them? For example, there was the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, the Shepherd of Hermes, First Clement, the Didache. Were these part of God's inspired word? The church had to wrestle with this question. <clears throat> Marcion had already decided for himself the canon he would follow, the Gospel of Luke and 10 Letters of Paul. 
the Montanists had gone in the other direction, not really needing a written canon at all. They only needed to have the spear inspire them and give them new inspiration. What the spirit taught was for them their canon. Now the idea of a canon was inherited by the church from the Jewish people. Yet what belonged to the canon was still a question to be answered. There were other books written between the New and Old Testament which we do not accept today as scripture, but which did exist. When Jerome translated the Old Testament into uh, Latin, he knew of those other books, but he rejected them as belonging to God's word. These books, which the Roman Catholic Church has now combined with the Old Testament, have been called deuterocanonical. The word deutero You can tell it's the beginning of Deuteronomy, which means the second law. In Deuteronomy, the law is given a second time. But Deuterocanonical refers to a second list of books which the Roman Catholic Church eventually added to the Old Testament. They included a book called Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, Tobit, and there were a few others. Somewhere in the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church officially um, embraced them. And then in the Council of Trent, when they were speaking against the Protestants who rejected the deuterocanonical books, the Roman Catholic Church condemned those who did not accept them as scripture. But what about those books that now arose at the time the New Testament was written? What should the church do with them? In 367, Athanasius was one of the people who wrote his opinion concerning the list that we should accept. And he drew up a list of the 27 books that um, we now have in our Bible. However, Athanasius was not the first person to do this. He was merely expressing the consensus of the church throughout. But when he wrote a letter listing these books in 367, it was as though the church breathed a sigh of relief and said, yes, we all agree to this. This is the list of the New Testament books we accept. Now, how did the church come up with this list? What was the process? Well, in some sense, the canon was completed and in God's mind listed after the last book was written, the book of Revelation. But humankind had to discover this list. The Roman Catholic Church believed that it had the authority to state what those books must be, that it could make the definitive act putting its stamp of approval on the books and therefore they belong to scripture. The Protestant view was different. It believed that God knew scripture and that the Spirit guided the church to recognize what God the Spirit inspired. And so the issue between Protestants and Roman Catholics became, did the church decide the canon, that was the Roman Catholic view, or did the church recognize what God had decided, that was the Protestant view. Nevertheless, if the church recognized that God inspired certain books, how did the church recognize this? Lesson three says there were basically two principles the church followed. First, they looked at the external evidence, meaning where did the book come from? Who wrote it? Was it written by an apostle? 
And in fact, most of our New Testament books were written by apostles, but not all. And those not written by apostles were written by someone associated with the apostolic company, the group, like Mark, who worked under Peter and the Apostle Paul, and Luke, who traveled with Paul for many years. The first criteria the church looked for concerned its source. Where did it come from? From an apostle or close associate of them. Secondly, there was the internal source. What did the book teach? Did it teach what the others book taught, other books taught? Did it teach the same gospel? Polycarp once wrote a letter to the Philippian church. And because he was so highly esteemed, for many years people wanted to include his letter in the scriptures. But Polycarp himself said, I am not writing you scripture, I'm only giving you pastoral advice. In effect, do not include my letters in the Bible. The Shepherd of Hermes was another book, long considered part of scripture or probably part of scripture. Many people thought it was authoritative. People included Irenaeus and Clement of Alexandria and for a while Tertullian. But there were two things that impressed the Christian church over the years. <clears throat> One, the Shepherd of Hermes was not written by an apostle. Rather, it was written in Rome in the second century after all the apostles had died. And second, the more people read the Shepherd of Hermes and reflected on what it taught, they discovered it concerned penance, repentance, how many times a person can be forgiven of a major sin. And it did not seem to the church that this teaching matched what the rest of the New Testament taught. And so due to this internal evidence, the teaching of the Shepherd of Hermes, the church at large eventually decided not to include this in the canon. In the time of the Reformation, Protestants held only to the 27 books we have in the New Testament. Protestants had a principle called ad fontes, meaning go back to the source. What did the original church decide? That was the canon they would embrace. The Roman Catholic Church held on to extra books because often they supported emerging practices which the Roman Catholic Church embraced, like penance. And so, some of the books in the Roman Catholic canon have been kept there to permit the Roman Catholic to con Church to continue some of its practices. And so, by the end of the fourth century, even before then, the canon was agreed upon that these books indeed were the books God the Spirit inspired. What about the church's creed? The first, the word creed means what we believe. It comes from a Latin word, credo, which means I believe. And a creed states the belief of the Christian, the beliefs of the church. Now in the beginning, there were brief, very short creeds or statements of belief. For example, one said, I believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God, our Savior. If you take the original letters, the first letters of the main words of that phrase, you come up with the word ichthus. This is a transliteration 
of the Greek word fish. And so, sometimes Christians summarized their creed with that symbol. This was sometimes a secretly known symbol between Christians, so they could identify with each other that they were believers by writing this in the sand, let's say, with a big stick. But this fish was really the summary of a very simple, short creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God, our Savior. Over time, churches wanted creeds which they could teach their new believers. And they wanted believers to uh, know this creed uh, as they prepared to become members to be baptized in the church. And sometimes the creeds they formed were used in the baptism services at church. These creeds became Trinitarian, and the one used in Rome became the pattern of our Apostles' Creed. The Apostles did not write the Creed. However, the Apostles' Creed reflects what the Apostles taught. Besides creeds, there was a concern in the early church for what we call, and what they called, the rule of faith. The church was looking for something even bigger than the Apostles' Creed to unite the whole church concerning what it believed. The rule of faith could be defined as a body of belief that summarizes the teaching of the Bible and that guards the faith from heretical teachings. Now what exactly that rule of faith contained and said was unclear because there was no one summary which the church agreed was a summary of their faith. Vincent de Lorenz once defined the Catholic faith this way, that which the church believes everywhere, always, and by everyone. He was basically saying the rule of faith could be defined by its ecumenicity, meaning Throughout the church, this statement was believed. It was defined by antiquity, meaning from the beginning of the church, these truths were believed. And it was defined by the consent of the faithful, meaning believed by all. The church was looking for something that the church agreed on from its beginning continued to agree on it throughout wherever the church was and that all of faith would agree to. Calhoun says there were two problems with this formulation from De Lorenz. First was historical. He says this simply was not true. It was not true that the whole church always agreed on a certain list of truths. And certainly there were theological problems with this because let's suppose the church almost agreed on something. Let us also suppose it was false and the church still needed to learn how to correct itself on this point. So the rule of faith could not be defined in terms of what everybody believes today because maybe the church has wandered and in fact, the church did wonder. So over the years, the church was looking for a rule of faith, and it really did not start to have them until the great councils took place and conclusions were made. The church also wanted to be guided by bishops, the leaders of the church. The canon was established, creeds were being drawn up, so now 
who should lead the church to guide it from error. In the New Testament, we find that church order referred to two offices, elders and deacons. Calhoun says even Roman Catholics believe that in the early church, the church established by the apostles, those were the two offices established then. But over the years, a hierarchy developed. And that is because over the years, certain churches gained prominence. In one church, there might be several elders, presbyters. But as time progressed, one gained prominence, maybe as the more effective leader or the more influential preacher. Furthermore, there were different churches which eventually gained prominence, some more prominent than others. There was Rome, and after many years, there was Constantinople. And so we have prominent churches with prominent elders or bishops. And in this way, a hierarchy was formed. The apostles appointed successors was the idea. And they appointed successors. And so the idea of succession developed. Not only then did people believe that church could have prominent presbyters or elders, but they also started to believe that there was a chain, one appointing another, starting with the apostles, going all the way down to the major leaders in the churches of that, of that time. And it was believed that there was a continuation of the apostles in the hierarchy of the church. Why did this happen? Well, maybe there was a desire for efficiency. Let's get the work done by those who can do it best. And also, there was a concern for orthodoxy. If the church could not agree on what was true, and if it did not have leaders to enforce what was true, how could the church continue in its unity and faithfulness? After all this happened, uh, as all this happened, each area, as I said, had its own bishop. We were talking about what they called monarchical bishops. A monarchical bishop. This word is Latin, meaning one. And this word is Greek, meaning rule or authority. When we say monarch in government, we mean there's one ruler over all of it, the king or queen. In this case, monarchio means the whole church is under one, a super bishop or an archbishop. And we will learn, too, that this word will, will be used of some who had um, heresies regarding the Trinity, those who stress the Father as being more divine and more powerful than the Son and Spirit had a one-person view of God, and they were called uh, monarchialists, as we'll talk about later. It has been asked whether Peter was the first bishop, because this is the claim of the Roman Catholic Church. And Calhoun says there's no evidence that he was ever the pastor of the church in Rome. And he adds, he believes that even Roman Catholics really struggle with this historically. The reason Peter has to be the first pope is for dogmatic reasons, in other words, the official teaching of the church reasons, but not for historical purposes because history does not support that idea.
So we've summarized what Lesson 3 says about the canon, about the creed, and about the bishops and the prominence they were gaining in the church. Now the last half of Lesson 3 speaks of the early church fathers. The early church fathers were a very important group. They are known partially because of their books. One collection of writings written by the early church fathers has 400 volumes, consisting of more than 100,000 pages in Latin and Greek. Not many people read the church fathers. They don't read the church fathers for more reasons than the many pages. One other reason consists of the fact that the early church fathers are difficult to read. They tend to be what Calhoun says is long-winded, meaning they take many pages to make just one small point. And one reason they were long-winded <clears throat> is because they made lots of digressions. <clears throat> this means they got off the point if someone is talking about, let's say, a forest, and then mentions uh, a frog in the forest, and then the next page he talks only about the frog and not the forest, he's making a digression. He's leaving his main topic and meandering into another area. And that was typical of many of the church fathers. Another reason they are hard to read it's because they loved imagery and symbolism. And sometimes symbolism is culturally limited so that if you're from another country from what I am, I might not understand your symbolism because your symbolism reflects your culture and associations your culture has. And so when we read the Church Fathers and see their digressions and their symbolism, we can quickly get lost and wonder who on earth, what on earth they're talking about. Now the lesson also talks about who these church fathers were. <coughs> and I want to explain some terms that will be used here. First of all, <coughs> we know the term Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea was a meeting of church leaders from across the church. <clears throat> Some of the <clears throat> church fathers we call Nicene fathers because they lived during the time of the Council of Nicaea. Then there are the anti nicene fathers this does not mean against as anti does. This means before. And so the anti nicene fathers lived before the Council of Nicaea. And then there are the post nicene fathers. And I think you might know that post means after. So these three terms are intended <clears throat> to separate the list of church fathers historically. Did they live before the middle 300s? Did they live during the middle 300s? Or did they learn, learn, uh, live afterwards? <clears throat> I want to read this extended quote from the Course. Let me try to tell you who the church fathers were. That is not easy because we do not have a precise list of them. We could say the church fathers began in the period of the apostles. That would be the anti -Nicene, uh, nicene fathers. This means they lived before the Council of Nicaea. The council took place in the year 325 AD, and there were many church fathers who lived before the third century. <clears throat> 
The next group is titled the Nicene Fathers, people like Athanasius and others who lived during the time of the Nicene Council. And then there are the post-Nicene Fathers who lived after the Council of Nicaea. How long does it extend? Here it becomes rather artificial. Some people think the last of the Church Fathers was St. Augustine in the 5th century. Others in the Western Church especially view the period of the Church Fathers as extending further so that people like Isidore of Seville of Spain or the venerable Bede in Britain were sometimes included. In some people's minds, the period extends all the way to the 12th century when Bernard of Clairvaux lived, who was often spoken as the last of the Church Fathers. So there's a great openness concerning who we're talking about when we talk about the Church Fathers, because there's no agreement concerning when this list ends. The Eastern Church often said John of Damascus, who lived in the 8th century, was the Church Father who ended the period of Church Fathers. So we can now understand that when we talk about Church Fathers, we kind of know who we mean, but we don't agree on who the last ones were. Where do they live? The early Church Fathers lived around the Mediterranean in Hellenized culture, meaning Greek culture. It means they probably knew the Greek philosophies and most definitely spoke the Greek language. Around the Sea of Galilee, there was a high concentration of the Church Fathers. Later, some of the Church Fathers spoke only Latin that would be in the West, while Church Fathers in the East continued to speak Greek. And so they lived really where the Church was, <clears throat> where the Church was in its first centuries, around um, where Israel lived in the Old Testament and around the Mediterranean Sea. Were they godly and righteous people? Calhoun says yes but they were like us with flaws, blemishes, shortcomings, and failures. And it gives an example in Tertullian, who was often a man with fanatical streaks. <clears throat> he mentions Jerome, who often had an unforgiving temperament. So they were people such as we, far from perfect, yet characterized by a passion for the gospel of truth. <clears throat> As we read the Church Fathers, everything they read will not be perfectly right. They made mistakes. Despite failures in charity and orthodoxy, the Church has come to honor them. And one of the ways we've come to honor them Historians often call the Church Fathers by their name with the word saint at the beginning, Saint Clement, Saint Ignatius, and so on. But two of the Church Fathers, the Church has not called saints. They include Tertullian and Origen. And that was because, although they made great contributions to the history of the Church, they also got involved in serious doctrinal problems. But apart from them, most of the Church Fathers have been called saint by their name. The lesson gives some examples of these Church Fathers. Clement of Rome, he lived there, he served as pastor. He was able to take time not only to serve his own congregation, but many congregations all around. So he had sort of a regional pastoral concern besides a local pastoral concern. <clears throat> 
there was Polycarp in Smyrna in modern-day Turkey. He died for the faith, and he wrote pastoral letters to various congregations in which he helped them struggle with the faith and with error around them. There was Justin, the martyr, who wrote apologies. He had a school in Rome where he taught many of the Christian faith. There was Tatian, the first theologian in Asia. He was in some ways a radical thinker, but a Christian. And um, he was involved in promoting the monastic period, the monastic movement. There was Irenaeus, born in Smyrna, but he became a pastor in other parts of Asia. A wonderful thing about him was that he was sent as a missionary to Asia all the way from Asia all the way to Gaul or France. There was Tertullian, a legal mind, who had much to offer the church intellectually as it struggled with how to label or describe the doctrines of Christ and the doctrines of the Trinity. Because of his great skill in language, he made up 509 new Latin nouns, 282, 84 new adjectives, and 161 new verbs. He is the one who made the new word Trinity, which was used to describe the orthodox view of Father, Son, and Spirit, three persons, yet one God. There was Clement of Alexandria, which would be in northeast Egypt. He was part of the famous school there, and he taught many, was highly influential. There was Clement's successor in Alexandria, Origen, he wrote books on apologetics, systematic theology, and commentaries. Calhoun says when Origen was good, he was very good. But when his theology was bad, it was dreadfully bad. He got many doctrines correct. He got some horribly wrong. His worst teaching, perhaps, was universalism, that Christ saved everyone. Another bad idea, he says God preserves free will, and because he does, the devil could fall again, and we could have a whole new history of the fall, a need for redemption all over again. And then there was Cyprian, another African like Tertullian. We're going to learn about an issue in which he was situated, and he had much to say to teach the church about the doctrine of the church. Roman Catholics, and particularly Greek and Orthodox people, venerate and elevate the church fathers. Protestants, except for the Church of England, have tended almost to ignore them. Yet Calvin loved to quote the Church Fathers. He respected them. He saw value in much of what they wrote. And the author basically says, Protestants should probably try to work harder at understanding what the Church Fathers wrote so that we could benefit and learn from them. This concludes Lesson 3. Welcome to Lesson 4 in the Mint's Course on Ancient Church History.
We're going to begin this lesson by talking about the people of the early church. There are some sources that were written uh, at the time which historians use to um, find out how Christians lived in the third through fifth centuries. First of all, we're going to talk about um, how churches got together, Christians got together for worship. Christians remembered Hebrews 10 verse 25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. In response to this, Christians worshiped together regularly. Sometimes they worshiped throughout the week, maybe besides Sunday, one or two days during the week in addition. Or sometimes they worshiped every day, early in the morning usually, so that slaves could participate and get back to the work they had to do for their masters as the day began. But the thing that we want to be clear on is that early church Christians worshiped uh, frequently and together. When it comes to the official day of worship, from the beginning, Christians worshiped on the first day of the week. Justin Martyr said, we hold our assembly on the day of the sun, meaning Sunday, because it is the first day, it was the first day of the week on which God put flight to darkness referring to Genesis 1 when God said, let there be light. He uh, put flight to chaos as he created the world. On the same day, Jesus rose from the dead, and some would add, on the same day, the Spirit came on the church. So as early as we can tell, Christians met on the first day of the week, the day of the sun that God made. The time of gathering was usually, as I said, early, often before sunrise, so that those who had to serve their masters could get back to work in time. Justin Martyr says that Christians met in one place, meaning they didn't worship at a different location each week. And often, where they met was a home, maybe the home of a pastor or a spiritual leader of the church. The family would open the house up as um, a place of worship every week so the whole congregation would know where to go. And as many listeners of this know, this is commonly practiced in many parts of the world today. The first church building that we know about was near the Euphrates River of the Roman Empire. It probably dates back to A.D. 230. The very early church had decorations and embellishments, sometimes a painting of the Good Shepherd or a painting of the King who conquers death and so on. We know quite well what Christians did when they gathered for worship. First, we know they read scripture and they heard the word preached. Calhoun says, Justin tells us that at Rome, scripture was read for long times, as long as, much as was permitted. He says, I think we should understand it wasn't a verse or two it was probably even more than a chapter or two. They read large portions of scripture every week. And then the pastor gave an exposition based on either what was read or another passage of the Bible. When they gathered together, they also prayed. Prayer included free prayers which referred to a prayer by the leader or pastor who prayed extemporaneously, meaning 
he didn't follow forms of written prayers. And there would also be shorter prayers prayed by the members who came to worship. These things developed as history progressed. Sometimes they started to face the east or the west, whatever direction the city of Jerusalem was, as a sign of expectation that Christ was coming. So there were additions in the details of how they prayed. Sometimes they sat to sing and they stood to pray. Many accounts exist of early Christians who do not, which do not mention singing, but there is also evidence that they sang when they worshiped together. Hymns were written as early as A.D. 200. When they gathered, they also celebrated the Lord's Supper. In the middle of the second century, two things were divided, the fellowship meal and the Lord's Supper. The fellowship meal or the love feast eventually was conducted after the worship service. And the Lord's Supper was celebrated uh, probably within the service. Then there was the practice of baptism. Maybe a practice that might surprise many students here. Baptism was certainly for adult converts of Christianity, and it was often delayed. It did not take place right away. In fact, some people thought it should be delayed a very long time. Tertullian, for example, said, if there are any who understand the weightiness of baptism, they will be more afraid of attaining it than delaying it. In Augustine's Confessions, we read that when he was a boy, he was quite ill, and so his mother arranged for him to be baptized but then when Augustine recovered, his baptism was delayed. The reason it was delayed is because people believed that baptism washed away original sin. And so if you can delay it, when you actually receive it, more forgiveness is given to you. This was an unusual and a biblical, unbiblical practice of baptism. But when people were baptized, often long times of preparation were done, sometimes as long as three years. People who were taught a catechism, therefore called catechumens, were entitled to use the name Christian. So if a person was being trained for baptism, he could say to his friends, yes, I'm a Christian. They were Christians and could go to the first part of the service until the Lord's Supper. Then apparently they uh, departed from it. Just before a person was baptized, there would be special events of preparation, fasting, all-night vigils, and finally, usually on Easter Sunday, the actual baptism took place. Now, how did the early church or ancient church view baptism? What did it mean to them? Calhoun says they almost always tied it to the idea of the forgiveness of sins, the washing away of sins. The doctrine of orig original sin seemed to flow more out of the practice of baptism than the other way around. It's not that the doctrine of original sin was clearly understood and then baptism was practiced. Rather, baptism was practiced and then people began to remember the doctrine of original sin. How did they baptize? 
Was it through sprinkling, immersion, or the pouring of water? The Didache says that water should be running water, not still water. Tertullian wrote, a person is dipped in water and sprinkled and then rises again. This seems to indicate both immersion and sprinkling. Hippolytus in Rome says, a candidate stands knee deep in water while a deacon pours water over his head or presses his head into the water. If you put this all together, you come up with the idea that it did not really matter how baptism was performed as the early church thought about it. As long as it applied water in some way, the church believed an effective baptism had taken place. Were infants baptized? Calhoun gives this as his answer. It is quite clear that infant baptism was an uncontroversial practice. When it was discussed, church fathers and other writers did not act scandalized or troubled by the fact that infant baptism took place. They only made comments about it, advice as to how it should be done, and so on. Tertullian opposed infant baptism in AD 200. He opposed it because he thought it was good to delay baptism, as we've mentioned already. But Cyprian, whom we will discuss later, advocated early baptism. He said, baptize quickly, even in less time than the eight days the Old Testament observed before circumcision. He wrote, baptize quickly because of original sin, so the baby does not run the risk of dying in sin. Cyprian thought that as the baby was born and started crying, the baby cried because it understood that it was a sinner crying out for God's grace. So infant baptism was probably done in the early church. But the reason why it should be done was not agreed upon. There are other topics about life in the early church. What about sex and marriage? Hebrews 13.4 says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. And the early church, during part of its time at least, tried to observe this. Marriage should be honored. It should be understood that marriage is an honorable state in which to live. Calhoun says one reason people avoided marriage was because they were uncertain regarding martyrdom. Since in some times many Christians died for the faith, they thought maybe it would be easier to die alone than to die as the father and husband because of all the suffering it would cause on the wife and children after the father died or was martyred. So marriage was still honored, but sometimes it was refrained from because of suffering and persecution. Historian Peter Brown wrote, marriage and children demanded a peculiar and necessary brand of Christian courage. Christians lived in the world, and there were two extremes they wanted to avoid. There was the anti-body, anti-sex view of the Gnostics, and there was the very licentious practice of paganism. Thus, you could get two conflicting worlds, one rejecting the material 
and the other reveling in sexual orgies and immorality of all kinds. Christians sought to avoid both. Sex was good and proper, but as Clement of Alexandria said, along with countless others, sexual activity must be limited to marriage and is to be undertaken as a purposeful, reverent behavior. But later on, asceticism and celibacy became elevated when monasticism began. And so the idea was no longer of marriage and family, but of celibacy and sexual abstinence as the mark of a complete Christian. Now what about Christians in society? Christians read from the Bible to be in the world, but not of the world. Christians struggled in the early church to put this into practice. Diognetus explains it this way, we belong to this world, we are citizens of this world. We do everything like other people do that we can within the limits of our faith. But at the same time, we are aliens. Calhoun gives three examples of issues in society. First, Christians were pro-life. They opposed abortion. They opposed infanticide, which were practiced in those days. Abortion was practiced, but less commonly because of the danger of death to the mother. A child was not really part of a family, in people's estimations, until the decision was made to keep it. Then they would embrace the, the child as a daughter or son of the family. That was the secular view. Christians opposed that way of thinking that you choose whether or not to keep the child. Another practice characteristic of the church, compassion for the needy. The church took care of orphans, widows, and the poor. There were less expenses in the church in those days. Frequently, churches did not maintain church buildings. They did not even pay pastors. Since pastors were not full-time, they had other vocations. And as a result, the churches had more funds available proportionately to give to the poor and needy. Thirdly, Christians tried to live decent lives. There were many activities, public activities, that, marked, that were marked with obscenity, vulgarity, at the public festivals and celebrations. Christians tried to avoid them because of their desire to live pure lives, lives which honored Christ. That concludes this section of Lesson 4 about the lives of Christians. But now we go to a second part of this lesson about the church in the 4th century, which you remember consisted of the 300s. There was a lot of confusion in the Roman Empire during the 4th century. For example, at one time, there were six emperors, all competing to be the emperor of the Roman Empire. Finally, Constantine won in that competition and became the emperor. As you may remember, Constantine became a Christian. The stories differ as to how it happened. But one account says that the night before battle, he received a vision, and he saw a Christian symbol. The Christian symbol 
have the Greek letter chi, which we pronounce in English as a hard ch with a k. And it had in it a rho, which is the symbol, capital letter, for the English R. These two letters form the first two letters of the Greek word Christos, for Christ. According to the story, Constantine saw these two letters, and he heard a voice which said, in this sign you will conquer. So he took it as a promise that he would win in the battle. He placed this sign on banners and army shields. And in 312 AD, his army won at the Milvian Bridge near Rome. That meant Constantine was now the primary emperor of the West. It means he started to think about who Christ might be. In the next year, Constantine met with the leader of the Eastern Empire, Licinius. And they together agreed on the Edict of Milan. This agreement stated that in both parts of the empire, the east and the west, Christians and all other practitioners of faith should have freedom to, to choose the religion of their choice. It meant that now Christians were free to practice their faith in the Roman Empire. Pagans could do the same. This did not last long, however, because soon um, governments and rulers wanted more control over the religious lives of the people. Now the question arises, was Constantine really a Christian? Calhoun says we have to understand that in the time of Constantine there was a monolithic monotheistic religion in Rome, kind of vague, but it worshipped Sol, the sun god. And it was particularly prominent amongst members of the army. Constantine and his father both belonged to the army. So there was a religion, monotheistic, which was not Christian, and maybe some of Constantine's language really reflects that non-Christian faith rather than the Christian faith. When Constantine became emperor, he minted new coins. And those coins depicted or had stamped on them the Roman sun god. And when he came into Christianity, he did so gradually the sun god remained on the coins which his government minted, though sometimes Christian symbols were also added. We do have Constantine telling us in various ways that he had become a Christian. In his testimonies, he sounds like a man definitely moved by the Christian faith. And yet, in his actions, he seems like a man unmoved by the Christian faith. He said he really did not live much like a Christian. We can see problems here. He was a man who really did not ever adequately understand the Christian faith. He later attempted to negotiate with different parties in the Aryan dispute and even tried to impose his understanding of the Christian faith, and generally it was a wrong understanding. Calhoun says, I think Constantine 
was a sincere man. He had a small understanding of Christian doctrine. And in his own personal practice, he promoted Christianity. For example, he exempted Christian clergy from civil obligations. Maybe, for example, church pastors did not have to serve in the army. He claimed that he conferred great benefit on, on public affairs. The first day, which had become the Sabbath, became more and more holiday under Constantine's rule. He gave many gifts to churches. He built great church buildings. And so we can see that many of his actions seem to favor the church. And yet some observers have been troubled by his unprincipled behavior as a ruler and as a general. Eusebius, the great Christian historian, calls Constantine a great Christian. He says it was a great thing that happened when the Roman Empire became Christian. He says Constantine is elevated by God to be God's vice regent. In other words, God's ruler on God's behalf. What Eusebius expresses is something we call today civil religion, an idea that the secular government is an agent of God just like the church is, not only in maintaining peace, but also that the civil government enables and promotes Christianity. It is unbelievable, Calhoun says, that we could go so quickly from a persecuting empire, Christ against culture, to a kind of Christian state where Constantine is viewed as a great Christian and Rome is something of the expression of God's kingdom on earth. Now that's all we have about Constantine himself. But what Constantine established has been called the Constantinian era, which lasted for up to a thousand years. The effect of Constantine had many good features. People had the freedom to worship without fear. Persecution was passed. Christians could exist like everyone else could. Christian ideals became more and more part of society. So on the Sabbath or Sunday, Christians could go to worship. Culture felt sort of Christianized. The effects of Christianity seemed evident in society. Sunday became an official day of worship in the Roman Empire. Infanticide was outlawed, and so on. But there were problems with what Constantine founded. Peter Brown talks about the conversion of Christianity. Not only did Christianity convert Constantine, but in a sense the Roman Empire converted Christianity because what resulted was a kind of syncretism, a merging of two worldviews or two religions, an attempt to blend them and make them one. Now wealth, power, and prestige became important to the church, whereas in the past that had not been the case. There's another feature in the church now that persecution was gone. Sometimes missionaries reported mass conversions. Thousands of people became Christians. When Constantine became a Christian, maybe 10% of the Roman Empire claimed Christianity. 
But by the end of the fourth century, their percentage was more than half. Perhaps two-thirds of the people in the Roman Empire claimed Christianity. But the question we have to ask is, what kind of Christians were they? We have to ask this because before Constantine, it was costly to be a Christian. A person be calling himself a Christian could easily meet death. So heretics stayed away, and those who wanted an easy life stayed away. But after Constantine, when Christianity became not only legal but favored, it was easy to say one is a Christian. It was an advantage to call oneself a Christian. And so nominalism became a practice. Nominal means name. And nominal Christianity means I claim the name as a Christian, but that's about all I claim in the Christian faith. Nominalism at best is very shallow Christianity. Often it is not Christianity at all. Besides the West, we can look briefly at the church in the East, in Asia, during the fourth century. The center of Christianity in Asia could be found in Persia. Christians came from Syria, they moved east to Persia. It is amazing for us to think of Persia as the center of Christianity because Iran and surrounding countries today are not the center of Christianity. But at this time, Persia certainly was. And missionaries were sent from Persia all the way to China. Calhoun mentions three leaders in the church of Persia, the East. Jacob of the Cities, a region along the Tigris River, an ascetic, a kind of monk. Monasticism was very popular in the East. After practicing monasticism, Jacob returned to the world. That means he left his cell and went back into the world, into the church. We think of Jacob when we think of the Council of Nicaea, because he probably attended it. There was Aphrahat, the Persian, the greatest theologian in the Eastern Church. He had a continual dialogue with Jews, giving his apology to them. According to Moffat, a church historian, his writings, the demonstrations, were a blend of straightforward biblical teachings and deep, disciplined personal piety. There was Ephraim the Syrian, the best known Eastern or Asian theologian and Bible expositor and hymn writer. Many of Asia's theologians wrote hymns in Asia, hymnody, monasticism, and theology all belong together. Now, when persecution ended in the Roman Empire, it began in Persia. And the church has probably never faced as severe a persecution as Christians in Persia did in the fourth century. One estimate says that 190,000 person Christians died in that century. There may be far more than all the people who died in two and a half centuries of persecution in the Roman Empire. And yet far fewer Persian Christians apostatized 
or disowned the faith than those who lived in the Roman Empire when they were persecuted. The Persian Christians remained faithful to Christ during that terrible ordeal. What happened in Africa? In Africa, we can think of the church in Egypt. It belonged to the Roman Empire, Egypt did, but the church there was strong and sought to be faithful. The church in Ethiopia and Nubia, which was just south of Egypt, now called Sudan, also saw great growth in the faith. In Nubia, um, which is called Ethiopia, the king converted to Christianity in 330. When he created coins, they had clear Christian symbols. In fact, the first coin to have Christian symbols did not come from the Roman Empire, but from Ethiopia. One Ethiopian coin from the time had a little cross on it. It was a small silver coin, but the cross was inlaid with gold. Christianity spread from the palace to the countryside in Ethiopia during the 5th century, largely through the witness of Syrian missionary monks. And then there was Nubia, present-day Sudan. In contrast to Ethiopia, the gospel began in Nubia with the poor, and only gradually did it spread to the rulers and other upper-class people. So we can be thankful for how the Lord caused the gospel to spread and how the early church, so often afflicted by great trouble and persecution, persevered in declaring the gospel of Christ, even to their persecutors.